we started camp last Thursday, I believe it was the first day that we reported. And, uh, and then we've practiced or have done something every day since and going into this first full week. Uh, what I'd say is about our football team, it's, it's exciting to see where we're at right now with the whole group because we do look physically uh, better than we did last year at this time. And of course, we probably have more experience at some of those uh, positions, those line positions where you need experience. They're a little bit older and you're starting to see that development right now when they're in their second, third, fourth year here. So that's starting to show up vis visibly as much as physically what I'm seeing on the field. Uh, start with the offensive line because that's a lot what I've been referring to is we do have good size there. Uh, it will be based off of the person to probably lead that charge on the offensive line will end up being Cal Twait. Uh, Cal is a senior, played as a freshman. Uh, he's probably as loyal to the University of Northern Iowa as any player that we've had and committed to the university and invested here. And he is, through his injuries, he's had to weather some adversity. So this is a very important season to him, uh, personally as much as it is to our football team uh, for him. Uh, other guys that uh, are in that group, with him that you should lean on a little bit. Jackson Scott Brown has really, I've seen uh, excellent improvement with him since this time last year. He's always been a starter, but now he's starting to be a person where you think that he could be a exceptional lineman for you and not just be on the first team, but be a difference maker for you. So I'd say Twait and Brown are two key guys there that are older. Others in that group, Putney, it has moved to the to the first team. Uh, he's been here. He's in his fifth year, and uh, he has uh, progressed himself. And he's with the first team right now, uh, playing a tackle spot for us. And then other guys that you'll look to down there: Spencer Brown, uh, Matt Vanderslice, uh, Nick Ellis, uh, Ezra Zerbeck. Those are other bodies that are. Uh, I believe our experienced bodies as much as physically uh, capable of doing the job and getting the job done for us as much as having experience doing it. So that would be the, the group as a unit and offensive line. When you talk about offensive line, everything relies on a tight end to have a really good offensive line. And our tight ends, I think, are as good as we've been in both aspects of the game in catching and blocking. You got Elias Nissen, who is a fifth year senior, came from Springfield. Uh, 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 Cedar Rapids area uh, in eight-man football and is really looking uh, like, a, like, like you'd hope a fifth-year senior tight end would for you. And then uh, Briley Moore has gotten some preseason hype, but uh, he and Briley to me are very equal candidates uh, for running the tight end. And if there's two on the field, they'll be the two out there that are, that are going, uh, uh, doing the work for us. After that, you can jump to the quarterback. Everybody wants to talk about quarterbacks, but the quarterbacks are only good as the only line and the tight ends are. And Eli Dunn is an experienced quarterback, a physical, strong quarterback for us, and a physically he can make the throws that you need to, as you would expect a fifth-year senior should be. So uh, where he'll get tested and where he's made progress is that taking on that role of what all quarterbacks have to have is that factor of uh, where a team has to surround you and believe in you making those last two-minute drives, that type of thing, which means you have to have great confidence. Experience breeds confidence. He got the experience last year, starting to see what makes great quarterbacks different. I'm starting to see that in Eli. Uh, if we can show that in game days, I think you'll see uh, a different person underneath center, uh, the way that he operates, hopefully, this season. Because I see that progress in him, and that's, that's because of He's more confident and more sure of himself just because of the experience. Uh, good receivers, he needs guys to throw to. I would start with Jalen uh, James first because of what he's done throughout the years he's been here and especially what he has done this past summer. Uh, he kind of took on the role of what DeReese did the previous summer. Kind of a guy that was always on the team but didn't stand out. Fountain stands out last year. I know that uh, Jalen has really put that kind of time commitment in this summer and trying to take on that same type of, take the same path as, as Doris did. Uh, two others to be aware of, and there are, of course, you already know about him. Isaiah Weston is another capable receiver. He's had some preseason things based off his freshman season. But uh, Jalen Rima 
is a guy that needs to progress from last year to this year. And again, that experience is what I hope brings him into the light because that's when he should start to show up is making plays, not that are drawn on a board. I'm always looking for what do you do extra, not what you're supposed to do. What have you done outside of what you're expected to do? And they are showing that, and that's why I'm excited about this season because this team as a whole has shown to do the extra things beyond what I expect of them. Uh, others that have showed up at receiver, Aaron Graham and Terrell Carey. Uh, Terrell Carey has really changed last year to this year. He's redshirted last year. Uh, he's a redshirt freshman this year, and uh, he has really performed well early in camp, and he had a great spring. Uh, running back-wise, Marcus Weimiller will be our leader probably of our football team and our offense, but probably the whole football team. And your leader, it's easy to say and be proud of your leader when he's a person like Marcus because he does the right things off the field. He cares about the university. He worked in the marketing department this summer as an internship. He's down at the state house trying to do an internship there for his uh, political science degree. Uh, the guy is doing everything he can to make himself the best he can as a student. And he's by far doing everything he can to make himself the best football player too. So Marcus kind of carries a load of what UNI is, in my opinion, not just UNI football. You could put him on the poster of UNI. So that's the type of person you want, uh, character-wise, uh, doing those types of things. And also somebody that the people that he's surrounded by, they all respect him because of the work that he puts in and put him in that position. It is because he's just a talented guy. He's earned everything. And when you earn stuff, people respect you. So Marcus is by far uh, put in that situation or in that uh, uh, that person for us. Uh, special teams wise, uh, the kickers, uh, Austin Earthham had a tremendous summer. Uh, Sam Drysdale was our starter last year. So yes, there is a kicking competition as there always is, but uh, Sam is very accurate. Austin is very strong. And uh, if they, we, can, we can find out what fits us best in what situation, we may kick them both, we may kick one, that'll sort itself out. But I'll give them both an opportunity because of the time they put in this summer and uh, what Sam has already done for us and the time that Austin put into it. And then it'll be based off, Koontz will be the holder, Michael Koontz, who's our starting punter. Uh, been here five years. Again, a guy that has done everything, kind of like a Marcus Weimiller, just not the, not the guy out in front all the time. But he's been here five years, probably one of the better athletes on our football team. And uh, he's going to be in his fifth year in punting for the first time. So, but he's been on every road trip we've been on since he's been here. So, uh, a very dependable person, but this is his year that it's his time to be our punter for us. Uh, Joe Frederick is the snapper in that. That should take care of the offense and the uh, specialists. I think I got them all. Defensively, we're a work in progress and only because of experience. We don't have a lot of experience, which breeds confidence. So, we have to make sure they're confident. I just have to make sure they know what the heck they're doing. So we got to get these this lined up and get the right people in the position that they can be effective with their talent. That's that's what we have to do. Uh, we have the talent. It's getting it so we can play to their strength. When you don't have experience, you got to play to their strength. So whatever the strength they show, when it shakes out here and it starts to kind of take shape here in the last couple of days, we'll design what we do based off what they can do and it's starting to sort itself out. So I'm starting to clean up the defense probably as of today. We'll start cleaning it up and really targeting uh, the beginning of the season, starting in today's practice moving forward. First few is to find out who we have, what they can do, and how well they can do it. So that's what we're sorting out. Defensive line, I feel very good about because you have Bryce Douglas coming back for a six year. You got Tim Butcher. Uh, uh, he came out of Iowa Central, but he's an old Old boy from uh, just Iowa that just works hard. You got Matt, uh, Brinkman. You know, Brinkman is, is just about as tough as they get. And then uh, who's the other tackle? There's four of them. It's Bryce Douglas, Jared Brinkman, Tim Butcher, and Hezekiah Applegate. Those four guys are your typical UNI defensive line. They are just going to be, they're going to be tough, they're going to be strong, and they're going to be able, they're, they'll, they, they better have a motor and will have a motor that they'll show up on every down. So, so we have four larger guys to handle the inside. Outside that edge, we're trying to figure out, it'll end up being Seth Thomas, Bronte Wells, Ricky Neal, or Ellerson Smith. Those type of guys give you a little bit more speed on the edges. So we're working through that phase of it. 
uh, inside, the inside linebacker that will make the decisions would probably be Duncan Furch. He's in his third year starting. Duncan's one of those guys that it, he's like Marcus. I mean, as much as you, you try to beat him out or try to recruit and one guy faster or bigger or stronger that might look a little bit more, uh, might look a little, bit, a little better getting off the bus, they can't beat him out because he always knows where he's supposed to be and he knows what he's supposed to do when he gets there. And that's what, that's what makes you great players. Uh, Coming off that, you got Jake Hartford, Chris Kalerovic, and uh, Kendrick Sunken. We'll try to figure out who that other linebacker is with Duncan. Secondary wise, start with the safeties because there's skill there. It's just what to do with it and where to put it. You got Christian Jagan, Suni Lane, Corby Sanders. They're all in the same class. They're all redshirt freshmen. In fact, Suni's a true freshman, so he'll be a sophomore now. So they're all second year guys. They got three years left. And they got the skill, and, they're, and now they're big enough and, and, and good enough to, to win. Now we just got to get them in the right position so they can play to what they can do right now this season. Uh, we'll talk about those guys. Trust me, I'll sit here and probably talk highly of them two, three years from now. But right now, this is when they're raw. They will play. And now we have to make them great players by what we do with them this year and give them a chance to be really successful the first game and not wait till two years from now. So, but they have the skill. Second corners wise, you got Xavier Williams, uh, Isaiah Nimmers, both out of Iowa. Recruited Roosevelt Lawrence is a corner. Uh, Austin Evans and Taj Moffitt is the freshman coming out of Washington that just got here the other day. They're competing for the corner position, and that's more of a skill set there. That's you just got to be good out there. You're on an island. Not a lot of coaching can save you out there. You're either good or you're not. So we got to get those guys lined up and put them in a position they can be successful too. So when I mean I'm trying to move this thing around and play their strength. I think it kind of describes what I just said. There's skill there, it's just raw, and but there's some physical uh, presence up front that's experienced and good. So how we gel together will make the difference in our season. So that's you and I football. Coaching wise, you probably asked me about that. Uh, over the summer, uh, well, let's just go over the defense. Defense is uh, Jeremiah Johnson is our defensive coordinator. He's been here 13 years and as good and loyal to this university as anybody that's came through here for us. Uh, JJ is tremendous because he remembers stuff I forgot. And he is, he can, he can do everything with our defense and he came here as a filmer, is where he came here originally. And uh, has worked his way from a filmer all the way to the position that he's in now. And he's probably the number one uh, guy on the staff sitting up there as far as knowing how to get things done at UNI as much as, as, as getting it done himself. Uh, DJ Volklek is coaching, uh, JJ will keep coach the safeties uh, and helping him with the safeties will be Aaron Savage. He's new. He was uh, an Auburn corner is why I liked him. He came from a championship program. He had been to Georgia Tech as a GA and he'd also been to Army as a GA, which are two highly academic school, very disciplined schools, and yet he was a corner at Auburn. I wanted the championship attitude. I wanted somebody who had to earn what they got. But I also like the fact that he had to be in two very disciplined programs academically to be a mentor as well. So Aaron's coaching the corners. JJ has the safeties. And the linebacker, DJ Vokalek, you can remember DJ was here 2000, I believe, three to 2005, something like that. He was a defensive coordinator when he played uh, Appalachian State for the national championship. And uh, he is back for his second year here. And uh, he coaches the linebackers. So he's just like another defensive coordinator. The uh, defensive line is where I changed a little bit. We hired Bryce Pop. Coach Pop will uh, uh, coach the defensive line, and Coach Braun, who was a defensive line coach last year, will be the special teams coordinator uh, uh, taking that role. So uh, now that you can do some things, special teams are a huge part. It's the first time we've ever had that type of situation uh, with that numbers on our staff. So uh, having Bryce back is very good for our team, and having Dave being able to focus, one guy focus on special teams will only help our football team get better. Offensively, uh, John Bond, quarterback coach, offensive coordinator, back from last year. Uh, Ryan Clanton is new. Uh, he's the offensive line coach. Ryan comes out of Oregon, but why I liked Oregon is kind of why we hire people around here in football. I, I, I want somebody from a championship program, but I also want somebody that had to earn their wings as a player. So he went to a junior college, slept on the floor, to get a chance to go to Oregon 
and then he played in a couple of Rose Bowl and a couple of championships with really good players, but he played because he was just tough and, and how he worked to become what he is. And if he can instill that in the players that we have, then we've got a good football coach. And as far as what I've seen, he does an excellent job doing that. So Ryan is a, is a great addition as well. Uh, coaching tight ends is Nick Danielson uh, from last year. Coaching the receiver is Pat McCann. And you've already kind of seen what he's done as far as developing players because Darius was a big part of the McCann. Uh, system of learning how to do stuff. He's done a great job with our receivers. And then the running back coach is Quentin Griffin. Uh, Quentin uh, comes from, he was the running back at Oklahoma, 99 through 2003. When I was at Kansas, I, re I tried to recruit him and apparently didn't get him. And then he went to Oklahoma, became a great player there. And uh, again, another guy that you hope will bring come in here, instill the work that it takes to be great, but also instill the 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 manhood in these guys that they need at this time in their life, 18 to 21, they need great leadership there and mentorship as much as they need football plays. So uh, I thought Quentin really filled that role for us. So uh, Quentin is a running back coach. I cover everybody, I believe. So that's you and I football. So it's up to you now. Any questions? Coach, how do you feel about your depth at running back, uh, especially now that uh, Jack Wager made his decision to leave the team? Uh, yeah. The, I'm fine with it. I mean, that's the great thing about you and I. It's you got to get the you got to get the the right people in every in every position and the right group put together. But you have Marcus Y. Miller, Trevor Allen, and Alfonso Soco, right? That's exactly how I recruited it. And most of our kids here are high school players, so the depth is exactly what the initial plan was. Sometimes you try to shore it up. And you might get lucky with with one or two along the way, so we we are we're 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 the same as we were last year. There is no depth; the same players. So we didn't we didn't graduate anybody running back, did we? Javion Browning. So Soko replaces Javion Browning. It's the running backs from last year. At what point did Brinkman really separate himself and become what's expected to be a starter for this team? When he separated himself, separated himself in high school first. Then he won the state championship in wrestling. I think we got like three state champions in wrestling out there. In fact, him and Butcher wrestled each other, and we still kid Butcher because he got beat by Brinkman. But uh, at the end of the day, Brinkman is just like his dad was when he played for us. He's just like, I mean, he's just tough. I mean, that guy, everything he does, he's so locked into it, so focused in it. He's just an intense person, very quiet person, but a very intense person. And the work that he's put in the weight room, he may be that tall. All right, but he plays that tall. Okay, so he uses his body as his weapon, and he's probably been looked over many times throughout his life because he's short. But everything he's done, he's been a champion at. If you look in his past, now he's doing it at a very high level, and he's reaching this standard and, and gone beyond that. So he has, he's really matured. But he's one of those guys that puts something in front of him and tell him he can't do it, and within a year he'll have it done. So he's a good football player and a good man. You touched on it, but to, to be able to get Pop back, um, you know, what he's meant to this program, obviously, over the years. And, um, you know, how did that kind of come about, you know, over the, the off season? Well, you, you said a mouthful there because that's what I'm always big on. The legacy of UNI football is huge. The tradition of UNI football, you have to understand it. And you have to breathe it and live it to understand it. And the first thing we got to do is respect the past of what they've done here. And then we have to find a way to do it better and match the past, which is very difficult to do. So you got to embrace the expectation of you and I football. And that is probably the biggest misconception of anything is this is a top five program day in and day out. You're all sitting here because it's always in, in the talk of the final weeks. Our job is to get them lined up for the first game and not the final week. You bring a guy like Bryce Pop in, he played here, he knows the people here, he knows how this place operates, he knows how to be successful within this environment, and he knows how to mentor and guide the players to take a guy that walked in our door, nobody recruited him. I remember he walked in his door, his girlfriend brought him here. Okay, nobody recruited him, brought him upstairs and they brought him aside, he's 6'5", 210, I remember he said, we'll take him. Okay, but his girlfriend said, hey, we're gonna, I'm gonna bring him over. Well, his girlfriend, now his wife, is one that brought him to our doorstep. So he came here and earned what 
the way that people talk of him right now. And he didn't do it because he's flamboyant and talking and jump in front of cameras and, and be in some, giving a bunch of Newt Rockney speeches. He just does it the way that he became a player. He just grinds at it every day. He speaks to them like young men, and he's a very good teacher. And since he knows his place, and since he, he's allowed to teach that way, he's successful. And he's made us successful in the D-line. You touched on it a little bit too, but how does Y Miller continue to surprise you with coming here as a walk-on and being kind of developing into kind of your number one option later in the year last year? Uh, you know, I'm going to go back to Weimarill. You can put Weimarill in the boat, Pop in the boat, Brinkman in the boat. Tell me the difference in those three guys. When you really look at them as men, they all have the same, the same kind of, the way of life. All right, they just get about it differently. And their way of life is, is that they're always trying to line up and they know that they have to beat somebody every day of the week. They don't assume just because you're picked to be first or that you did this, that next year you're gonna do it again or you should be number one. They have earned everything. Marcus Wyman has earned it and yet he still has earned it today. He's probably as concerned about getting beat out this afternoon as maybe a guy you know, that just got here. But even though he is in that position, in his mind he has worked to that level to be able to compete against the guys he's going to line up against. So he just separates himself in that way every day of the week. He does it in, in the classroom. He does it on the football field. And that's why it, the ceiling's the limit for him. He'll only, he'll reach whatever he tries to do because he believes in himself and he believes that hard work will overcome any barriers that'll show. Do you see you guys using, we saw kind of in the year we were using different formations where he's kind of taking the, taking the ball and running with it, kind of like a wildcat formation. Do you see yeah. something similar to that? I'll put him anywhere. If you see him on defense, don't be surprised. You know, I'm going to use him in every position that he can bring strength to our team. And then yet he has to be fresh. So yeah, he will be running back. He will be slot receiver. You know, if I need him at the wildcat, we'll do it. Uh, what would you call it? Put him at the quarterback. Whatever helps our football team, he will do because he'll know it and he'll put the time in to be great at it. So we'll put him where he'll help our team without wearing him out. And since he got that ankle repair in the off season, is this as healthy as Marcus has been in, uh, in quite some time? Oh yeah, for sure. He played all last season hurt. And uh, so yeah, he is, he's healthy. But honestly, as I watch him run, he looks the same run of the day as he did in those last games when he had the bad ankles. You know, that's how bad he was gutting that up going through that. So. Hopefully he'll be a little bit quicker and a little bit uh, more sure of himself because of a good ankle. But uh, he still is practicing the same way as I can't tell. I'm envisioning yesterday's practice. He looks running yesterday like he did the last week of the season last year. But he does have a good ankle. And, and uh, so I'm sure in his mind he feels 100% better and more confident because he's got a strong ankle. With Eli, it's kind of rare to see a three-year starter here. Um, and I know obviously he didn't play every single game last year, but you know how does he play every single game this year? Obviously staying healthy, but um, you know where have you seen him from where he was as a sophomore, perhaps when he got kind of thrust into duty to where he is now? What I see is probably what you'll see is early in his career, he probably made some choices when he had to start to scramble that weren't maybe what you want to see from a quarterback, and that's because of experience and. It isn't like he's going to be fast and run away from his problems. Young guys can get away. If you're fast, you can run out of your problems and look like you know what you're doing. If you're a big guy that throws, you can't run away from your problems, so you better throw yourself out of your problem. And he, that, you got to learn that. So he had to learn that in front of everybody. And I think that's made him the better quarterback today because he's experienced the good and the bad when he doesn't make the right choice. So he is committed to that and really made himself a better player out of season, but more so maybe because of the things of how he had to grow into the position and now being the, the three-year starter. With expanding on Eli and Coach, uh, he's had a various number of injuries uh, over the last couple of years, and he's had the opportunity to work with Coach Bond for a full off season. How has that helped him in improving his confidence, as you said before? I think it's probably more critical for Eli than other quarterbacks because of his personality. Working with Bond for two years, Coach Bond is a very calm, you hear that same voice. Think about when you guys go to work this afternoon or anybody in the sitting room. If you're hearing the same voice, that kind of you understand what they expect. People don't know what expect me because I get loud all the time, so they don't know if I'm, 
I sound mad all the time, but I'm not. But if you hear that voice all the time, you understand the person that you're trying to communicate with, then you can respond to it. So I think that's what helps him more so than everybody, because one or two words or a look or a conversation, Coach Bond knows how to communicate with him, what he understands, and I think Eli knows what Bond's trying to get out of him in a shorter uh, communication phase. You know what I'm saying? So just a call from the box to the floor, those are only seconds. A lot of stuff has to be said in seconds or understood. Let's put it that way. A lot of things have to be understood in that one little conversation of from the floor to the headset. And I think those words, that terminology and that relationship, that's where you'll see more of a confident player because they understand each other better. What does Xavier Williams need to do to kind of take that next step? Buckle his chin strap up and, uh, and, and attack. And that's about as easy as I can say it. What I tell him if I was sitting in a room with him, what he needs to do is, I'd probably say buckle his chin strap up too, but I'd probably, in, in, in his fashion, he is very athletic. He's never played corner. You gotta remember, this guy came out of Burlington and comes from a very small school. So he's learning football and a run. And, you know, he goes out in the high jump for the track. I mean, he was a big part of the, the MVC championship because he hit the high jump. He didn't even practice. He just goes out and jumps seven foot. So it's kind of like corner. Everything's came so easy to him because he's so athletic that he can go out and play corner with just about anybody, defend any receiver, kind of just because he can. What we need to draw for him is buckle up and put the detail into it and not only be a good corner, but be a great corner. Figure out the detail to take that same talent and separate yourself. And when he figures that out, and that comes with age and maturity, when he figures that out, he'll be a great corner that'll be able to play on Sunday. When you look at the uh, inexperience of the defense, uh, I would assume this would be an important time to have like one or two guys out there kind of quarterbacking the thing, kind of being the glue guys. Who are you seeing in those kind of types of roles? Duncan Furch, number one, I'd put, I'd say. Uh, he has tried, to, and he can do so more with the front. Bryce Douglas is really doing a nice job with the front. I mean, he's trying to be vocal and help the younger guys out. Those two stand out to me, but they're in that front seven. So it's the guys behind them that don't get connected to that as much just because of how you play the game and the voice flexion of those people. So they need somebody behind them taking that role. And I'd say Corby is trying to do that right now. I think Christian is just trying to figure out, he just moved to secondary, so he's just trying to figure out for himself what he needs to do. So Corby's really the only one back there that can bring him together. Now, the one name I have missed that I should bring up is because he hit your role, what you asked was A.J. Allen. A.J. Allen is like a coach out there. A.J. Allen is, knows you and I football because his dad played here. A.J. knows me, and A.J. knows what we expect. And because of all that, he is in that group, and he is with those guys every day in their ear what they should be doing outside of football. If you're going to play at Northern Iowa, you better be doing this outside of football and not just when you get to the meeting. You better be doing this to be successful. Otherwise, it, you, you won't be as successful as what you think you will. So AJ is that person now that you bring that up. How healthy is AJ? You know what? He's got two good shoulders and uh, he's got all kinds of bolts and stuff in him right now. So he's, as long as the bolts and stuff hold up, we'll be good. But he is healthy and you can tell in his demeanor, he's just a great personality. He's probably the personality, honestly, of what uh, Fountain was last year. You want to get a guy where Fountain was kind of always having fun and always showed up for practice and always would, you know, lighten up the thing as soon as you talk to him. That's AJ Allen, okay? And now that he's got two shoulders and not sore all the time. Of course, he's even a little bit more vocal and a little bit more enthusiastic. So, yeah, he's kind of that presence that Fount Fountain was last year. Building off that, how big of a hole does Doris's graduation create, both on off the field and? You know, how are you guys ready to address that? Oh, well, that's, you know, what we're working on right now. Somebody's got to take that role uh, and fill that void. And it's not something I gift to somebody or something that I assign to. It's really got to come from within your team. And who starts to do that? Who's got the comfort and the confidence to do that? AJ does this year. And, uh, you know, Doris was impactful. But let's be honest about it. Doris wasn't a big topic here on media day last year. Okay. Doris became a topic when he became MVP of the East West Shrine game. So a lot of these guys may not be the topic today, but may be the topic in January. And we'll see where that leads to uh, by how they perform. You mentioned Taj Moffitt in your opening remarks. Uh, 
as far as the cornerback position is concerned. What has that kid showed you so far? To mention him, your opening remarks, because it's not too often a true freshman corner is on the field. No, the, the, there's three freshmen that kind of jumped at me. Moffitt did because he's so smooth. Corners are corners. They're like running backs. You just see them. And then you figure out you know, how to teach them and, and make them better. But they show up because of their, they're just smooth. I think you all can go walk out there. I don't have a great term for it, but you know it when you see it. And he's very smooth but yet he's got good speed to him. And yet he's very instinctive too. So he's been well coached and trained throughout his whole life. I can see that already just by walking in the door in a few days. The other guys that have skill sets to at least talk about as freshmen is uh, Dion McShane. Uh, he has a skill set uh, that uh, we're trying to figure out. And then uh, Eric Mooney is another one that has a skill set that I'm going okay, what can I do with this? And when I say that, the guys that show up as freshmen are either really big or have good speed. And those are speed guys that show up because they have good speed and yet they, they're getting lined up correctly. So, and they're still playing fast even as, you know, third, fourth day of practice. Or you gotta find a really big guy that's doing really good right now. But I'd say those are the three freshmen that have just kind of showed up by, you know, just maybe flybys that I know I should, I gotta go back and, and watch them a little bit further just to make sure we use their skill if we can this year. How much do you think last year's playoff experience A benefits this team and the guys who played in it, but B was it were they kind of like deer in the headlights, you know, experiencing it really for the first time? Yeah, the the you always well they hear about it all the time. It's in their face every day when you look at the wall. So everything they see and hear around here is kind of the the great thing about playing in Northern Iowa is the double-edged sword. It's just in your face every day. And it's expected of you to play to this level. So when you don't make the playoffs, the guys that feel the worst about it are the guys that are on the team, because not because of what people say, but how they feel because of what we, what we live with every day of our life. When they make the playoffs, now it's to be, to be successful in the playoffs. And the teams have gotten there. Last year's team got there. They had to dig themselves out of a hole to get there, but they beat number eight, number six, and number four, I believe, three out of four weeks that we played. And, uh, but again, if they can, they know they can do it. And what they also found out is if they do it within our system, they're really successful. If they try to break the system, you know, we're also just as good as we are. We're just close to the top because you are at the bottom all the time. You got to play within a team and you'll get the one point wins. Otherwise, they're going to be one point losses and all those add up. So, yeah, so I know they're, they know what it takes and they know what, how to win the one point games, what they really have to do to win the close games because you got to win close games. How important is it to have a defensive signal, signal caller uh, like Furch working with Johnson on a, an experienced defense like this? I think, I think you want an experienced person, like you said, that you want somebody that they can look to you know, you can't be on the field with them all the time. You can't be in the locker with them all the time. Who is that, who is that voice that they actually listen to? Even though they might not be looking when they're listening, they are listening to that voice because they trust that voice knows what it's saying. And having somebody like that within our program like him, I think it brings that confidence and poise you need to no matter what happens during the feet season, you can get high or you get low, you can face adversity or you could have celebrations he can still be that steadying force in the locker room to bring that calm, to bring it up or bring it back to base so that we can get ready for the next week because this is all about the next play the next week. And he gives you that by calm, steadying force. Is this the year where Elias really takes off as a tight end? I know we saw you know, flashes of what he could do last year. I think a lot to have to do with some of these players we're talking about right now is staying healthy during the season. I mean, Elias really got good last year and then he got hurt. You know, Marcus got really good last year and he got hurt. Uh, Darius really got good his junior year and then he got hurt. So if we, can, if we can keep him on the field week to week, you just continually get, you see progression. And then at the same time, we all get hurt, all right? It's how you play when you're not at 100%. And you have to appear and play at that level even though your body is restrictive at that time. And that takes older guys to really understand what that feels like and how to do it. I feel like we ask it every year, but what do you see from the Valley? The Valley is, you know, it's a strong, it, we, we all know that's a very strong league. That's, that's a given. 
but I think what's happened in the Valley is, is the separation you're starting to see in college football at our, in our division, maybe what happened in BCS level years ago uh, when they all transitioned into conferences. I see the Valley growing exponentially versus maybe some other teams that are progressing along. I see this league expanding more quickly. And it has a lot to do, look at the draft picks that have came out of here. Uh, look at the look at the number of players in the NFL out of the MVC. Today we've got 11 players in the NFL from Northern Iowa. I mean, unbelievable when you think about it in comparison when Bryce and James Jones were the only two years ago. Now do that with some other teams uh, and add their players into it. So the the talent is better. There's no question the coaching is better, and the atmospheres are. We probably have some of the best places to play in our league because of how these other universities that have invested in their program. South Dakota State, uh, all the Dakota, South Dakota State, North Dakota State, and uh, South Dakota are investing heavily into their football facilities right now. So that's why I say you're starting to see what happened at BCS maybe five, six years ago, is actually the first conference to really adapt and adjust to it is the MVC. They're the ones that are starting to do those same types of things and grow in that way, I think, as I look at it from Cedar Falls. How about your non-conference schedule, Coach? Does that um, make you prepare any sort of specific way, especially when fall camp starts to wind down, you get closer to going to play under the lights in Missoula, you got to go to Kinnick? Yeah, I think, I think that it's a, it's a, again, being part of Northern Iowa, you, 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 you embrace the expectation, but you embrace the role of wearing that logo. And I think, I think a lot had to do with the times of these games and who we're playing in these games has a lot to do that there is a, you know, the University of Northern Iowa is going to bring a quality uh, chance for your, for your team to play at home. Be like us getting a Montana to come here. There'd be a lot of respect there. And playing Montana at night, playing Montana in the day is tough. Play them at night, been there, done that too. All right, Montana at night is ramped up. Uh, then you go to uh, Iowa, playing them in the afternoon, Tough playing them at night, really tough. Okay, it's just because the energy level of what the fans bring to that game, I think, is what separates those afternoon games from night games in those two stadiums. And then you get back into our own stadium. We've got North Dakota State in here, South Dakota State in here, and I think as of today, they're number one and they're number four as of today. And they'll probably be that when they get to that game because I look at their schedule, they'll still probably still be number one and number four when they play us. So and then that's just those two. Throw in South Dakota and Western, who weren't even ranked. They were in playoffs last year. And then put the ranked teams in there, Youngstown, Illinois State. I mean, these are all teams that we're lining up at. So it's a great league, but it doesn't matter. We're in the league. I don't worry about who. It's what we can put on the football field and how we perform on Saturday for that first play at Montana. Because it will be, the environment will play a factor in those games and we have to we've got that challenge and that's because you're wearing that logo as much as you know you're the opponent they get excited for anybody but i think it gives a little bit more environment i love night games in here because i think we're more ramped up at four o'clock and seven o'clock so it's the same thing i believe that most people see at their own stadiums just because the fan base is more uh i don't know there's just an energy base down there so you all know what kinnick is like at night <laughs> dang all right, so I just thought that was a privilege. I'm excited for it only because we're all from Iowa, and I think one of the coolest games in the state of Iowa is the night game at Kinnick. And quite frankly, the night game at Iowa State is always fun as heck, too. So, you know, Jack Trice has become awesome to play at. Kinnick is awesome to play at the first time we get the night experience there instead of the 11 o'clock game. So it's totally different for us because we've always been the 11. So, you know, we've got some great football in the state. What y'all would appreciate is reporters. Man, there are some good coaches in this state, and there are some good football teams in this state. Are they flashy? No. Are they good? Every year. Okay. And, and I'd say high regards to both those two guys because we try to emulate some of the things that they're doing. Anybody else? Coach, uh, last year at this time, Spencer Brown was transitioning from tight end to offensive tackle and became a starter early in the year, and then he had the knee injury. Mm -hmm. uh, has he fully recovered, and, and where does he rank now? He. Uh, he was running with the first team right there. 
he beat up his hand a little bit the other day. He'll be back and everything like that, so he won't practice for a couple of days. But uh, he is, he's a big man when you get down there with him. And, uh, and he is, again, small football, eight-man football again. Okay, if you're, you ought to take an eight-man pitcher down there sometime see what they look like now. But uh, Spencer Brown's eight-man football, he's just learning the game. And, uh, and now he's whatever he is, six, seven, 300 pounds. Uh, a couple years later from being 6'7", 220 pounds. But he's he's taken on the role of an offensive lineman. He accepted that role right out of the gate, and that's what made him get to the point that he is in a very early in his career. If you don't accept yourself as an offensive lineman, it's hard to be an offensive lineman. But he took the role on wholeheartedly from the beginning, and uh, and it really became a good lineman. He's got to play. You know, he's he's potential right now. He's not a, he's not a player yet, but uh, he's got a lot of upside. Anybody else? Thanks for coming today.